Wisconsin and its 10 electoral votes could be decisive in, Nove in November. So we want to take some time to listen to what voters there have to say, especially in the swingiest of voters in the swingiest of states. These are Wisconsinites who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and Joe Biden in 2020. Here they are weigh weighing in on Vice President Kamala Harris taking over the Democratic ticket. Many say they're feeling some Barack Obama vibes. I think she's similar because she's confident in what she says, but she's not egotistical. She's compassionate on the way she speaks and the way she delivers things. I feel like I could probably get into um, a really good conversation with both of them, and they would actually listen. When she talks, she does it with a sense of authority, and that means a lot. Look, this is a huge advantage for Trump and Trump's team. And when Trump talks on message, it is the economy, it's inflation, it's immigration. And those three issues, they are like plus 15 or 20 in everything you see in terms of national mood. Um, and if that starts to shift, it's a huge problem. The other problem, too, is listen to how the focus group reacted to Donald Trump's appearance at NABJ. He's just basically saying that she she can't she's only just, you know, pandering to whatever she feels. And she can be both. Indian American and black. I feel like it's very racist and ignorant. Ignorant. Why, why would you even say something like that? Like, it's just foolish. It's just disheartening to hear that from someone who's leading a country full of a mixing pot of people. Uh, we should note, everyone said they were troubled uh, by particularly the Kamala Harris became black uh, comments. Uh, one person said they thought Trump said them because they were true at one point, but everybody else, everyone was troubled by it. And I think to your point earlier, which the through line between Biden and Harris is they just want Trump out there. Mm -hmm. And people remember on some level. What does the campaign think about that? Yeah, so I, th I think it's interesting because when I go out and talk to voters who are critical of Donald Trump, most often it's because of comments like that. It's because of his his posts on Truth Social. And, and a lot of people just say, you know, I liked his policies, X, Y, Z, but I just wish he would take a step back. Um, and it's interesting, too, because there's sort of been a shift. A lot of what the campaign is doing and the super PAC associated with the campaign is focusing on the traditional issues, on the economy, on immigration, on the border. And then you see Donald Trump sort of getting into this different message. And now you have a campaign that's trying to figure out how do we sort of placate the candidate while also focusing on the, the, these issues that voters care about. Um, that are, you know, arguably what they want to hear more than this, you know, DEI and and whatnot. But I would just say that the campaign, the Trump campaign has been arguing for a month now that they were going to change, that he was going to change, that he was going to be this reformed candidate, that he was going to talk about mm -hmm. unity, that he was going to talk about coming together. Listen, I was in that room at NABJ in Chicago last week. That was not about unity. That was about the former president making a point on that stage because we all know that Kamala Harris has always been black. Yes, she is also South Asian American, but she is black. That is not something that people just thought was not true, right? So I just, I, I think that, the campaign really feels as though they don't know what to do with the former president because he is going back to that 2016 mm -hmm. grievance argument um, that uh, was successful in 2016, but it doesn't feel as successful right now. Right. Right now, it's a reminder uh, of 2017 through 2020. All right, guys, thank you very, very much. The Trump campaign is desperate to distance the former president from Project 2025, and his running mate has said Donald Trump speaks for himself. So here's what Trump himself said at his press conference today on just one issue, the issue of abortion access. Would you direct your FDA, for example, to revoke access to mifeprestone? That's one of the things so that's you been could, discussed. So you could do things that will be, would, would supplement, absolutely. And those things are pretty uh, open and uh, humane. But you have to be able to have a vote. And all I want to do is give everybody a vote. And the votes are taking place right now as we speak. Is that something you would consider? But it's a very good, there are many things on a humane basis that you can do outside of that. Now, here is what Project 2025 has proposed on this. Quote, the Food and Drug Administration is ethically and legally obliged to revisit and withdraw its initial approval of abortion drugs like mifepristone. 
Let's discuss this and more with former Democratic Senator Bob Torricelli of New Jersey and Tim Miller, Hope of the Bulwark podcast and the former communications director for Republican Jeb Bush. Tim, it's been widely reported that Donald Trump was briefed by the Heritage Foundation president on Project 2025. He was on a flight with the president of 2025. He's very closely aligned with the Heritage Foundation. So how does the campaign think it can keep saying Donald Trump, he didn't know anything about it. It's just not true. Yeah. Well, and one of the guys that was uh, a main player in a Johnny McEntee was called the deputy president uh, in the last year of the presidency and was kind of behind a lot of the staffing moves that prepared them for January 6th, moving people aside and getting more cronies in there. Uh, and then you have J.D. Vance wrote the forward to the book for Kevin Roberts, uh, which is upcoming. Uh, Kevin Roberts, the head of the Heritage Foundation that ran Project 2025. Literally, the forward of the book was written by J.D. Vance, not a blurb, the forward. So, you know, look, these guys are tied to it. Um, the key the key point here that they are um, eliding uh, is that it's sure it's kind of true that Donald Trump speaks for himself and Donald Trump doesn't think deeply about policy and he just words, word vomits, et cetera. But the people that would work in a second Trump administration are the people that are working on Project 2025. And, and they are the ones that will staff the agencies. And that is the scariest part about Project 2025. And if Donald Trump actually wanted to distance himself from Project 2025, he would say, I'm not going to hire a single person that was involved with this project. But he's not going to do that because those are the loyalists that he's going to want and need in the next administration. And so I, I, that uh, you know, really is, I, I think, the fact that reveals how, how absurd it is they're trying to distance from it. Bob, what is so stunning is if the contents of Project 2025 were so offensive, were so off-putting to voters, why on earth would they publish this thing? But now they have. So are Democrats doing the right thing, hammering this and trying to educate people with what's actually in it? Well, first, I, I've seen this so many times in campaigns. That, you know, God help you from your own allies. Uh, they'll cause you problems every every time. It is the difference between ideologues in a political campaign and the practical politicians who are trying to win elections. And you're seeing that classic conflict. I'm not sure in the end this brings any political mileage to the Harris campaign, though. The only arbiter of what the candidate believes in and what he embraces is the candidate himself. So people can have fun with this, but I'm not sure it has any, in the end of the day, any electoral value. Were I in the Congress... I would be watching for some of the people who were authors of some of these statements as they seek to populate another Trump administration, if it, if it happens. That I would do. But the rest of it, I'm not sure it has political value over time. Well, then let's talk about Kamala Harris's campaign, Senator, because I think it's fair to say the last time you and I spoke, you were worried about President Biden's chances. You were concerned that America was forgetting what it was like to have Donald Trump as a president. Well, now we see who Donald Trump is. We're reminded with press conferences like the one we got today. And now we've got a new candidate in VP Harris. How are you feeling now? Maria, Trump claimed yesterday at his news conference, he never said Kamala Harris, quote, turned black. Here's what he said yesterday. Listen to this and what he said uh, a few days earlier. Listen. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black. She was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went, she became a black. She went to a historical black college. How is she only recently decided to go out? Well, you'll have to ask her that question because she's the one that said it. Uh, I didn't say it. So you'll have to ask her. So what do you think? Is this tactic, this new tactic by Trump going to fix this issue for him? Absolutely not, Wolf. And it's going to underscore just how weird he is, just how completely detached from reality he and J.D. Vance are. It also underscores, Wolf, the fact that I think he needs cognitive testing. If he really cannot remember what he said just a couple of days ago, that should be really, really concerning, if not for the fact that he forgets what he says one day, uh, you know, just 24 hours afterward, but also the fact that he lies so easily. And that's nothing new. But I think that's why you're seeing 
the growth and the incredible momentum that you're seeing out of the Kamala Harris, Tim Waltz ticket. And I still don't think that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance and their campaign understand how to run against it. They are running uh, in the past. Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are running for the future of this country. And I think that that's one of the reasons why you're seeing this huge growth and excitement, and you're only going to see that grow in the days and weeks to come. We shall see in these coming days and weeks. Uh, Mar- so you can see that there's a MAGA civil war a brewing, folks, and you see it with those regular voters, some of whom were MAGA. Uh, disappointed with Trump, not happy. Some of them switching to Harris. Some of them don't know what they're going to do. Uh, Some of them, even if they like Trump still in some ways, are kind of frankly disgusted with how he's been talking about Harris. Uh, It's just, it's not very presidential. It's not what a decent human being would do. But you also see this playing out with Project 2025 because Trump has tried to distance himself from it. Now, you shouldn't believe him. The only reason he's saying, I have nothing to do with the project I don't like it. Uh, I don't even know what it is. I don't know anybody involved. All of that's a lie, right? The only reason he's saying any and all of that is because his polling is tanking. And this is one of the reasons that people have seen just a, just a taste of what's in that evil document, the hundreds of pages, and they know it ain't good. And so moderates, even some soft conservatives, certainly everybody on the left and, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatnot, hates it. And so Trump is trying to distance himself. But the problem with that is that that's angering a lot of Trumpers because they like what's in the document. And not only do they like it in an abstract sense, Trump staffers and Trump allies and Trump members of Congress, Trump lawyers, Trump judges... They've all had a role to play in the crafting of that document. So Trump, in a very public way, is spitting in the face of his own MAGAs. And now you're seeing this to start. Well, I'll probably have more of this to come. Trump's turning on his buddy Joe Rogan. Because because Joe Rogan, you know, said that, you know, if he's going to support anybody, it's going to be RFK, which is silly. But for Trump, that's bad news because Rogan's audience likely leaned more towards Trump than Harris. And if he's saying vote third party... That likely translates into this MAGA civil war, yes, raising RFK's vote total, but the expense not of Harris, but of Trump. And in close swing states, a strong RFK performance equals a Harris victory. So this civil war is going to be delicious for us.